it costs about ten dollars a piece when they're imported to the United States so they're um, pretty pricey and have a really short growing period um, so you can find them in specialty stores um, only a couple months out of the year um, in May and June so and then our newest member of the family Somers coffee um, Somers coffee is chicory coffee so in northern India they drink a lot and a lot of chai and in southern India they drink a lot of chicory coffee so that's the inspiration behind this brand new baby um, and then all of these are also rum based they're based uh, they're Caribbean rum that is we source from St. Croix and they're all quite delicious in these easy and simple to make breakfast cocktails I find that I drink a lot more in the morning than I used to. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it's really good in a smoothie too. Can I replace my mango in an energizing smoothie in the morning with the mango? Absolutely. <laughs> that decision for you. Can you go back, Lisa? So that particular type of mango that um, was selected for the blend, do you have like a, a master blender? You know, like all the scotch companies and the wineries love to talk about. CFO and we call her our chief labor officer and she's the wife of our owner. Um, her name is Swati Garg and she literally developed all of these flavor profiles in her kitchen in her home here in Burr Ridge which is where our home office is. I love that this is like a little local story for Chicago. So great. I didn't know. Amazing. Yeah. And I love all the girl power too. That's very cool. <laughs> run owned and operated company um, lots of girl power in this in this group here. very neat and then you know I saw when I looked on the website and sort of googled around a little bit I mean there's a lot of interesting things you can do with cream liqueurs that you wouldn't immediately think of right I guess all of us knew about the cream liqueur and coffee because you know adding that one that starts with a B and ends with a Y into coffee is a pretty thing that a lot of people do but I, so I really wanted to do a fizz today because everybody here who comes a bit knows I'm obsessed with egg white cocktails. So thank you for being amenable to putting the coffee into a fizz. Let's do that drink. I'm ready. Sounds good. Did you want to leave this or did Coho want to leave this? I'm happy to. I think we'll have you do it because it's your recipe, even though I tweak it. But, but we're going to try real hard to make it look like this or even better with a really good foam. Okay, take us through it, Lisa. Okay, so I pre-measured out my two ounces of Somers coffee. I've got half an ounce of bourbon, half an ounce of orgeat. If you don't have orgeat, you could use like an almond liqueur, uh, amaretto. Simple, yeah. And then my egg white. Close this up. Oop, oop, last table. Give us a good shake. Little dry shake first. That's my ice to my glass while I'm doing this, so it's all ready to go. Okay. How much egg white did you put in? Did you use um liquid or real? I use real, so I just did one. One ounce? Mm-hmm. Then I'm going to add my ice here. What did I forget? I put the samras, I put the bourbon, I put the simple, I put the egg white. An egg white, you're good. Okay, I'm ready. You're good. So dry shake away. I've already got my ice in here. I'm dry shaking. <laughs> now I'm adding ice. I don't know how foamy it looks. It smells good though. Yeah, coffee and almond are like affinity flavors, so they go really nicely together. They're great complements. Yeah, I see Karen shaking too. Woohoo! Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, 
All right. Next last. I try to make this. I may or may not have um, dropped a label in there. <laughs> I just saw Kaho put a spring in his shaker. Oh, Is that yeah. a secret, Mr. Kohlmagic, that we don't know what you're doing, Kaho? <laughs> We just saw you put a spring in your shaker. What is that I, doing? You put the spring from a Hawthorne strainer and that helps make it even better. Oh. <laughs> oh. I know, he's got trade secrets. Yep. <laughs> I don't think I got so foamy. I got pretty foamy. We'll see if this rises though. I think that my um, egg whites were too old. <laughs> Use the aquafaba? No. I'll use the aquafaba next time. I also forgot to get the soda, so let's do that. Oh, mine was not going to be as pretty as Coho's, I can tell. That's, that's, that's the foam I got. Let's see, let's see. That looks beautiful. All right, I'm about to do mine. <laughs> I can't wait to see you using soda. <gasps> it's a little foamy. I don't think my foam is sturdy enough to make it above the top oh, though. The lip? Yeah, I don't think mine is either. Maybe a little. Oh, oh, I got a little. You do. Oh, no, fail. <laughs> Worked for like two seconds. Above the lip. I'm above the lip, people. I'm impressed. <laughs> Nice job, gang. Karen, did you do a foamy drink too? Et voila. Um, a little bit of foam, but I put it in a martini glass and I'm loving it. It it's tastes delicious. Yes, yeah, okay. delicious. Well done. <laughs> well, cheers, everyone. Thank you for sharing a bit of the Samara story with us, Lisa. It's so fun. And these are so delicious, and I look forward to playing with them more. Awesome. Now that we have something to drink, we always make sure that there's an option for people to eat something. So <laughs> I'm going to toss it over to Mark, who gave us a really fantastic hummus recipe, which I've certainly purchased and eaten many times, but I've never made it at home. So until Kaho has his perfect drink ready to show us on screen, we're gonna have Mark take it away and take us step by step through making hummus. Because as the New York Times said a couple days ago, dips are for dinner. I've always believed that. I've actually had a dinner party with eight different dips and I gave you all of the recipes <laughs> for all of the dips. That's actually the party, that top picture. Uh, it was a party that I threw for friends where we just had dips and crudite and it was the most fun party ever and I never had to sweat in the kitchen. It was so great. But Mark, are you ready? Let's I make some hummus ready. together. Uh, the story behind this recipe is it's, it's part Lebanese um, and it's part um, like Armenian from two of my friends that so kind of combined the, the two. Um, so I have everything nice on plaza over here. Um, so to keep everything super simple. So the first thing is, is we, uh, I just used canned garbanzo or chickpeas. And the secret is, well, make sure you save the juice. So you can always use it as an egg white substitute in the future. Um, but really, really rinse your Let's chickpeas. Let's on that for a minute. This is aquafaba. Yeah. Has anyone read about this? When you have chickpeas, you save all of the liquid from the can when you drain it. And it works like egg white. So amazing. It's also good in Asian cooking. It helps thicken sauces as well. Love it. Another trade secret. Um, so make sure you rinse your chickpeas really, really well to get rid of all that goo because otherwise it, it turns your, um, your hummus kind of rubbery instead of smooth and fluffy. So I have one can of super rinsed chickpeas and it's going into my Ninja. Yes, the ninjas. <laughs> What's that? My favorite, I have one. <laughs> Eat with the ninja. It's <laughs> all about the ninja. And then what makes this recipe so simple is that you can just throw everything into a food processor or blender, turn it on, and then you're done. 
Um, but if you really want to be picky, then you can hold the oil on the side and pour it in so you can get the desired consistency. And of course, I wrote in the recipe that if you're trying to watch the fat content, you can use ice cold water to get the consistency you want. And having the water ice cold keeps the hummus really smooth and really fluffy. So I have in here, I have my salt, I have my paprika, not, not, not paprika, cumin, <laughs> a pinch of uh, turmeric powder if you want. It just gives the hummus a super yummy uh, flavor and also really beautiful golden color and plus turmeric is super healthy for you. We love garlic in this household. So there's three cloves of crushed garlic um, and there's also a half a teaspoon of baking soda. So that's what I learned from my Lebanese friend is that her grandmother has always used baking soda in the hummus to make it extra, extra smooth. Wait, so that's so interesting. I never knew that. So would the baking soda be in the grocery store hummus, do you think? No, right? I don't know. I've actually never read because I, I, I find that homemade hummus just tastes better than store-bought hummus. No preservatives and I know what's in it. Yeah. And also turmeric. Do you usually have ground turmeric around? Is that something that you use? Um, I do. I always have turmeric powder just because of the health benefits, anti-inflammatory. Um, I do often drink golden lattes, which is your turmeric-based latte with some oat milk, cinnamon, um, cardamom. Oh, look at that. I see someone. What is Christine showing us? Is she showing us her, her, her turmeric? Turmeric. There, there you go. Nice. Um, I also have... I like to put it in my Western water. Yes, it's good for you. All of my Middle Eastern friends are just yeah. like... Like if you just need a little hint of antioxidant protection or some anti-inflammatoryness or from or some something good for your gut, add a pinch of turmeric to anything that you're cooking so you don't really taste it, but it just gives you that added health benefit. Here are some fresh squeezed. I have a bunch of fresh turmeric. Oh, do you? Well, yeah. grind that grind that baby up. That will work too. It smells so good, but it turns like my whole kitchen orange. <laughs> And then I'm using, oh, look at Kaho. Okay, wait, we need to pause for the, to stop oh it. my God. Back to the maestro. <laughs> oh my God. That is so Not quite as good as last time, but you know, it, it did, I did okay, I think. No, I like this one because it's a little more, it's like flat. You're, that one was curved. I love, nice job. Wow. More than okay, that looks delicious. Cheers. Yay. So then I'm also using some organic tahini. If you don't have tahini, you can use Asian uh, Chinese sesame paste um, or some sort of a, a nut butter that doesn't have a strong flavor because peanut butter is just going to change the flavor. Almond butter is pretty good. Cashew butter is okay. But tahini, which is ses ground sesame, um, is the best. And I'm going to put about a half a cup in there. Oh, I need to stir this and shake it. Also, Lisa, I told you this yesterday, but this coffee flavor is insanely good. I mean, whoo. When is it available? When is it available um, in the market? Like when will people be able to buy it at stores? Can they get it now? Yeah, it should. It should be available in stores in September. Woo Thanks for everyone who trusted me with their address to send them a little sneak peek. Yay. All right. I just added about two tablespoons of olive oil into the blender and I'm just gonna pop, like just go at it and then if I need to add more olive oil to make it smoother I will do that. And while everyone's blending, I'm getting my water ready to warm my sake with Tim. So if you have a pot of water, we can go ahead and warm that up now, right, Tim? Because we want it simmering. Mm -hmm. And then I have some sake chilled in the fridge, and then I have some room temperature sake too. That's perfect, yeah. So I'm just scraping down the walls of my, of my blender. If you really want extra smooth, uh, hummus and you're super anal retentive, what you can do is actually go through each chickpea and take off the skin and then you'll get even smoother hummus. Mark, no one's doing that. No. And that's, and that's hardcore. That's, that's for the hardcore folks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Sonica's doing that. 
This is good cardio, Annika. This is hummus cardio. <laughs> Don't own a, own a blender. Yeah, no, go for it. <laughs> All right, Mark, how is it? It looks delicious. So let's pour it out so we can see the texture. So I like mine pretty rich. Can you um, hold, it, hold up the spatula of it so we can see? So it's, it's, it's smooth and creamy. Can you see that? Yeah, yum, it looks so good. I'm gonna pop it in a serving bowl. Nice. Okay, so here, so here's what really makes it authentic, okay? So you just take your, take your spatula or your spoon and you dig a little well, okay? You're going to just top it off with a little bit of really good extra virgin olive oil in the middle. Yum. Then you're going to sprinkle. If you don't have smoked, regular paprika works too, but you're just gonna do a little dash and there is your hummus. Wow, well done. I have a whole, I learned from the best Belinda, which is you. So this, this, is, this is my, my hummus tray. Beautiful, I we love some it. Baby peppers, some baby carrots, some endive and some freshly cut pita. That's a meal. That's maybe two meals. It's fantastic, and it was so easy. <laughs> well All done, right. Mark. Should we do the next dip? Yeah, there's another dip, because Tonya brought her A game today, and she has a dip to share with you, so we're going to spotlight her. So, Tonya, will you tell us what dip you're doing, why it's your favorite, and then take us through it. So, super, super easy and no-brainer. French onion dip. Yes, that's a favorite of mine too. I love it. Two simple ingredients. Mm -hmm. I went to the store late night. No creme fraiche. So I've got some natural sour cream and Lipton's French onion soup packets. All you do. It's the best. Why is it so good? Yep. Oh Wait, do we have to have a conversation though, Tonya? Because you know, maybe somebody really loves the Noors French onion dip packet. I don't know if there's like a Jets and Sharks situation for French onion dip, but I'm with you. I love Lipton's. <laughs> it's a and you know what? Some people may think, oh wow, Lipton's really, but it's classic. It's so classic and it's good for so many different things. Yeah. You know, you can just Boiling water, some broth, just some French onion soup broth, or you can do what we're doing, making a quick, fabulous French onion dip. Yep. All you have to do, take your sour cream or your creme fraiche out of the container, 16 ounces, dump <laughs> it in. There may be a little liquid. That's okay. You just mix it together. Take your... French onion soup packet, open it. There are two packets inside, only use one of them. And put it inside your sour cream or creme fraiche, stir it up. <laughs> and voila. There oh, you yeah, go. I'm, I'm nominating you for the next Food Network star and for <laughs> all of the things because when an award-winning sommelier tells you that this is her favorite something, we have something there. Also, hey, Lifton's, maybe give a girl a call. <laughs> this is a great app. Okay, so before we get to sake, Tonya, so we both love this dip. You can also add caviar, a layer of caviar over oh, the Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I've got chips, too. I've got kettle chips, black pepper, kettle chips, that, a little French onion dip, some fresh sturgeon roe. It can be from California. It can be, you know, Russian if you want to get real fancy with it. Okay. And dig in. And that's a meal completely. A little rose champagne, a little cava, a little prosecco. And, That's it. Hey, mom's the word. And you've got dinner. You you got dinner. Your kitchen talent is astounding me and I love it. <laughs> 
Well done. I mean, this is a party. House made hummus a la marche, and then house made French onion dip with fancy accoutrement from Tonya. <laughs> okay, so it's not over all of the fun for today. We also want to continue our exploration of texture with a really great expert and maestro and a new friend. So Tonya, I'm gonna pass it over to you to introduce our next guest. So it's, I am so honored and excited to welcome Tim Sullivan uh, to the show today to teach us all things about sake. Um, from the first moment that Tim tasted sake, he was hooked. Um, he I don't know which one started the first blog on, uh, on sake and was the first person to be invited to go to Japan and spend a year and uh, learn how to make sake. And he's been into it ever since. And he also has been given the award of the sake, sake samurai. And yeah. so is that a real award? Does that come with a medal, Tim? <laughs> no, all I got was a sake cup. Oh, pretty great, you know, you a gift. <laughs> it's, it's really, I'm super excited to have you here today because you are a sake expert and we all love sake. We don't all know how to read the labels. We don't all know about the textures and the flavors um, of sake. And so super excited to have you here today. And you're also the brand ambassador for Hakkasan. Mm. Okay, we have. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So can you lead us through? What are, what are sure. we looking at here? What, is, what does yeah. the label say? What's happening? Well, yeah. this says Hakaisan, Eight Peaked Mountain. So there's okay. a mountain right by the brewery. Uh, the brewery name again is Hakaisan Brewery. And in English, that means Eight Peaked Mountain. So the mountain by the brewery has eight small peaks on it. And that's where the brewery gets the water. So they named the sake after this mountain that's immediately by the brewery. And I, as you mentioned, I got to live there for one year. I did a one year internship making sake. That was in 2017. And yeah. it was such an amazing experience. And my respect for the craft of sake brewing just went through the roof. I respected it before, but after doing it for a whole year, you really get a true uh, respect for the craftsmanship of it. Yeah, so this is, I'm the global brand ambassador for Hakkai-san. And I picked this sake in particular in the Japanese market from my brewery. This one in the brown bottle, the Honjozo, is our best-selling sake. And the reason that from our brewery, this one is the best-selling is because you can serve it at many, many different temperatures. And that's what I want to demonstrate today. So- And what does Honjozo, I'm sorry, what does Honjozo mean? Hmm. What does that mean? I don't, what that I don't know if we have if we have the slide to put up with the classifications. If we don't, it's all right. But if we I forgot, but we'll it. we'll send it to people. Sorry. Yeah. So it's a classification. No okay. Yeah. So there's two things that influence the classifications really quickly. One is the ingredients, and one is the rice milling rate. So they mill or they polish the rice down before they brew sake, and the smaller you mill the rice the more premium and the more expensive the sake is going to be. So if you, you might have heard this word Junmai before. Anything yes. that has this word Junmai next to it is what we call a pure rice sake. That means that it's rice and water only, no additives. If it doesn't say Junmai, this one is called Honjozo, nothing Junmai around it. So that means this is an alcohol added style sake. So some sakes are for, lightly fortified and some are not. So if you see that word Junmai, that means pure rice. If you don't see the word Junmai, the classification is alcohol added. Now, Honjozo is the entry level to premium for the alcohol added styles. And uh, yeah, so that's in a nutshell, that's what Honjozo means. So Tim, I think you were the first person who ever said this. For those who don't know, I sat in a, a media sort of class with Tim and a lot of very well-known writers. And he was the first person that actually said that clear enough that it made sense. Because I don't know about you, but we go to the sushi restaurants and it's always like, I'll take that one because divine droplets sounds like fun. And I never really understood what the difference was between all of these classifications. So thank yeah. you for that. <laughs> so Honjozo is a more affordable style of sake in Japan. 
and it is great generally for serving warm. So that's why I picked this style for today's experiment. I saw in the chat earlier, someone had a question about how much water to put in the pan. And it depends what you're gonna to use to warm up your sake. You want the vessel that you put in the pan, you want the water to come about halfway up the side. So that'll determine how much water you wanna put in. So if you have a pan on the stove, you want the water at a light simmer. So you want to see little bubbles around the edge. The temperature in Fahrenheit would be of the water would be around 160 to 175 degrees. And you want steam coming off the top. So just a pot of steaming water. And when you're ready to um, put your vessel in, the most important thing to know is that you have to turn the heat off. So we're going to warm sake using res residual heat only. So if you're up to temperature, uh, you can go ahead and turn the heat off. You should have a pot of steaming water on the stove, really easy. And then I'm gonna use this. This is a tokuri. This is, you may have seen these in Japanese restaurants. This is a Japanese sake carafe. If you don't have this, you can use something like a Pyrex. And you can put this in your hot water. Everyone has one of these around the kitchen. Um, so you can use one of these. Or you can also use a coffee mug if you really wanna get MacGyver on it, okay? So I'm gonna use this carafe from hakai -san, and I'm gonna just take my sake and I'm gonna fill up the carafe about 80%. Tim, we have a good question from yeah. Jessica. Go ahead, Jessica. So I've always been told to drink warm sake with warm food and cold sake with cold food. Is that true in your opinion? Uh, that's a good rule of thumb, but I am here to break all the rules and tell you to break all the rules. Um, awesome. I, think people, I think people look for rules and guidance like this because sake is so confusing and so foreign. But I'm here to tell you that you can do nothing wrong and you have permission to try it any which way you want. That's so my favorite answer. It. Yeah. <laughs> the sake samurai gives you permission. Um, we have another question from Michigan. <laughs> I'm in the country in Michigan and I didn't yeah. have time to order yours. But I bought this one. It's the only sake I could find after going to three stores. Oh, oh wow. wow! But it's a June Mai, and how bad was this decision? No, that's good. That's perfect. You want an entry level sake, so uh, that's perfect. Yay! Definitely. Okay, thank you. So, yeah. So what I did was I took my carafe and I put it in the hot water bath, and we're just going to let it sit. And I'm going to give it a quick temperature check. Okay, so my water is at 175, which is perfect. Now, while that's warming up, I'm going to also have a glass with room temperature sake in it. So if you have a little bit of your sake, you just want to put it in a glass without chilling. Uh, this is totally room temperature. That's and a really beautiful glass, too. What kind of glass yeah, do you have? This glass is actually produced by Hakai San Brewery. So the brewery I work with uh, made this glass, and uh, they sell it only in Japan. It's got a very wide bowl on the bottom and a narrow nose. Um, so uh, this is something that uh, they actually sell at my brewery and it's got a very short stem. Uh, in Japan, things are closer to the table. There's not a lot of long, tall stems. But All the right. reason for that type of glass is so that you can aerate exactly. and also get all the nuances um, on the nose and on the palate. Absolutely, yeah. This is um, designed just for that. You know, you can uh, do it and you know, the reason I wanted to do a room temperature sample as well is because when they do the national sake competition in Japan, when the government judges sake, they do everything at room temperature. So there's no temperature variation to hide behind. So it's very important when you're studying sake to taste things at room temperature as well as chilled or warmed. Uh, it's one of the joys, one of the charms of sake is that you can enjoy it at this wide range of temperatures. And that's really what I wanted to talk about today. So if you have a chilled bottle as well, I'm gonna get mine out of the ice water here and do a quick temperature check on the bottle. And that's at 47 Fahrenheit, which is pretty chilly. Okay. And I'm gonna put that in the glass as well. All right. Smells totally different. Yeah. yeah. So if you wanna smell the room temperature and the ice cold one side by side. Wow. Yeah. It, you can see how it suppresses the aroma completely. Mm -hmm. um, Hakai-san is a restrained aromatic sake to begin with, 
but when you over chill it, like this is really an example of over chilling when you get the frost on the glass like this. Um, yeah. Oh, you can smell how um, much more restrained and held back the aroma is. So I'm gonna go ahead and give the ice cold one a taste first. Tim, do you do the same things for sake as we do for wine? Like try to slurp it all throughout all the corners of your mouth and add air, all that kind of stuff? Absolutely, you can do all of those things with sake as well. Uh, we're using wine glasses here as an example. Um, I, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, just a couple things to be aware of if you're approaching sake from a wine person's point of view. One is that sake has about one third the acidity of wine. So you're not gonna get that acid profile that you may find if you're used to drinking wine all the time. Uh, the other thing is that sake has seven to 10 times the amino acid profile. And amino acids are the proteins that come from rice and they're gonna give us that umami flavor. You know, that is a big buzzword now and it is right. the cornerstone of Japanese cuisine is umami. So sake has a lot more umami than you're ever gonna find in wine. So that's something you want to look for is that savory note, that little bit of uh, savoriness that you get in a wine. That, com that, com sorry, that com comes from sake. That comes from the proteins that are in the rice grains. Okay, so now I have the one thing that I, I, I noticed um, tasting the chilled, it is restrained. It's got more savory kind of green notes, but very subtle. Um, shoot tendrils, but mm. there's also this um, salinity that's there to finish, which is really quite refreshing. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, when we not. go back to talking about food and wine pairings, what would you pair with a sake like this if you were in a Japanese restaurant or having mm. a Japanese inspired dish? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. Um, my favorite pairing with the Hakai San Honjozo is actually yakitori. So yakitori is a grilled charcoal grilled chicken on a skewer. And it's an allegory for having grilled chicken in any culture, I think. You know, so, uh, but the yakitori is so good because it's a lighter meat. It's not a red meat and it's not going to overwhelm with umami, but there's some there. And the charcoal gives it a little bit of the smoky flavor. And yeah. it is just really savory and delicious. And I find that the dry finish on the sake really cleanses the palate from something that has a little bit of fat to it, like, like the, um, the yakitori does. So that's, that's, that's one really, of my favorite pairings. That's mouthwatering. And yeah, I, I know. can totally visualize that. And I can taste that on my palate. And that's really, really awesome. Tonya and Tim, it's actually also making me think of the halal guys, so like in New York, all the corners yeah. where they have the falafel and then they have the oh, yeah. with the chicken. Absolutely. Next time I'm going to bring a flask of sake with me, I guess, <laughs> when I go to get my um, falafel balls and chicken kebabs. <laughs> I'll, bring cool, I'll, bring cool, I'll bring the cooler. Excellent. Good. Also, I think Kaha has a question for Tim. Go yeah. ahead, Kaha. Like, you know, I, I was sitting this one out and then I remembered... I think I have some sake sitting around in my drawers. And then I looked at them, I was surprised. Oh I, are these, these are Hakai San, right? Yes, that's my brand. <laughs> oh, Amazing. Like, cool. like they, they must have been a gift or something. And I forgot about them, but now is a good time. To freezer, go. put one in the freezer. Yeah, sure. <laughs> the green bottle's the one you want to open. The, the other one you showed is a sweet dessert sake. So the green bottle's the one you want to try with this. Oh, so I, I just, think that one would be yeah. closer to it. Okay. How funny. I just took my hot sake out of the water bath. So it's been about five minutes and I have my thermopen here and I'm just gonna go inside and check the temperature. And uh, I'm at about 128 Fahrenheit. And you really don't wanna go much above 130 or 135 okay. Fahrenheit. That would be the upper limit for piping hot sake. I'm so excited. My mom told me that my grandfather used to always drink warm sake at home. So this must have been how he did it. Very cool. Yeah. And if you, um, if you have a, an Ochoco, this is a, this is a sake cup. Um, this is ceramic. You can use one of these. If you don't have this, you can use a coffee cup or a ramekin or anything that's safe to drink, even a teacup that you can drink any hot liquid out of. So I'm gonna give this warm sake a taste now. I just had the chilled, the room temperature, and now I'm gonna try the warm. Oh my gosh, it is so different. 
It's a totally different thing. The air, it's a different candle. It's like a different smell. Everything. Yeah. And it's really enjoyable and the texture changes so much. That's what always gets me. Um, really, really uh, uh, texture that spreads on your palate far and wide. Whereas the really cold one, if you want to sip that again, the ice cold one is just crisp and pointed and just disappears very quickly. Wow. I mean, as it's going to turn to fall at some point for all of us, mm. it cools down a bit. I can't wait to have this in the arsenal for something warm to sip and something that's warming. I mean, you're right. The texture is completely yeah. different. Yeah. Wow. So room temperature is really, it's silky. It's not oily. It's, it's, it's silky. It's like spun yeah. silk. Yeah. This is how life should always be. Many, many glasses, many, many delicious things oh, to drink. Yeah. Tonya, this so is the part of- To take the many, many glasses away, I'm like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> well, <laughs> always keep them, because it's always interesting to see how things change over time and how temperatures change over time and all of that. So uh, this is fun. I don't know how many people are getting to do this exercise, but it's a pretty neat one. It's like super good. <laughs> yeah, if anyone has warm sake at home, let me know how it's warming up for you. If you yeah, like the good. taste or hate the taste, let me know what you're, uh, what you're yeah. sensing. So Tim, I was just thinking, so this is our warm sake. Like I yeah. find that it, it has, um, like the alcohol hits me in the face way more <laughs> than the yes. room temperature or the cold. Yes. Um, which is very interesting because it's like, it's, I, I, I grew up always being told that warm sake is usually cheap sake, so don't drink mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Because uh, they're covering up the bad flavors and I guess warming it makes it taste more expensive. But my question to you is like, if I really wanted to show off and, 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 and like impress, you know, the peep, the, 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 the sake sommelier at, at, you know, in New York somewhere, like what is the ideal temperature to drink? And what to request, okay, right? And what to request, yeah. Yeah, well, I have a chart on my website uh, that lists all the different Japanese names for all the warming temperatures. So if you wanted to impress a sake som in New York and you requested your hot sake at a specific temperature, uh, that's pretty, uh, you know, that's a pretty big flex right there, I think. Um, so one keyword is uh, nurukan. Nurukan. Nurukan means gently warmed or lightly warmed. Mm -hmm. And that's a temperature I like to drink at a lot. Atsukan is the default word. Atsukan just means warm. And that is the temperature we're drinking now. It's uh, noticeably hot and you'll see some steam coming off. If you want a gentle warming, it's nudokan. If you want a super pronounced warming, it's Atsukan. Yeah. So um, Charles Curtis, a yeah. palate, told us that, I don't see you on camera though, Charles, said too cold wasn't great, too warm wasn't his favorite. He did like the slightly chilled and he ended up marrying the cold in the room temperature. And that, tell us, tell us, Charles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For me, you know, I totally agree with Tim that the, when it was too cold, the, the one that came straight out of the fridge, it, yeah. it really damped down the nose and you couldn't get the full aromatic complexity. I was kind of digging the room temperature one. I thought it was very expressive. Lots of floral notes, plenty of really pretty fruit character to it. <clears throat> so that was really good. Um, the warm one, I thought it was drinking a little hot. And I get what you're saying about the texture is very enveloping and very, like for the fall, it will be great. But yeah. it's yeah. five degrees in New York City here. So I wasn't, I wasn't so <laughs> into <instantly> warm. And <laughs> for me, the Not for today. The two right. Glasses together the cold one and the room temperature one it yeah was like just slightly chilled like say it came out of a real proper cellar at 55 degrees that would yes. be for me i think that would be like an ideal temperature the one yeah i mean i've never i don't know about you charles i've never done this exercise before with sake so i think yeah. it was really no i had neither so i um i was very happy to have the chance to do it yeah really interesting it, the pro. You know, oh and it's and it's really very much when we're tasting as well, it's 55 and a little bit above. We like to get all the textures and the flavors and, you know, all the true notes. 
And I agree with you. Um, it's, uh, I like the two of them together. The warm is delicious, but I would like it just not quite so warm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the great thing is there, there's a range of warming you can do. And when you okay. find a sake that you really like, I always encourage my students to, you know, take it out of the fridge and take a sip and wait five minutes and sip it again. And as the temperature slowly warms up, you can find that sweet spot where you really enjoy it. Same with warming sake. If you warm it a little bit and taste it, warm it a little more and taste it, you'll find a sweet spot with a sake that you like, whether you want it warm or chilled. And uh, again, experimenting with temperature is one of the fun things we can do with sake that you don't see in many other alcoholic beverages. And we had a question about microwave, yay or nay. Oh, <laughs> oh I've got one right here. <laughs> After warming sake um, though, right? <laughs> uh, using a microwave is not 100% forbidden, but it's, it's a little risky because you can yeah. overheat and damage your sake very, very quickly. So you can go from, there's no control when you warm it in the microwave. Right. Um, but if you have no other option, sure, you can, you can put it in the microwave. There's lots of uh, restaurants that are, you know, more izakaya style, sake pub styles, and they warm it in the microwave real quick. We recommend the water bath method because it's slower and you have more control over achieving the temperature you want. But if it was an imagine, emergency. I imagine the poor sake molecules just being like, you know, yeah. <laughs> bombarded in the microwave. So we want to make it gentle and easy. We had another question about storage for open bottles. What do you, Ooh. Karen, what's your question? Um, I'm just curious, not having been a sake drinker, I now have sake. Do I put it in the refrigerator <laughs> since it's open or do I keep yeah. it on the shelf? Yeah, you want to treat sake like a wine. You want to keep it sealed up and you want to keep it in the refrigerator. That will help it last the longest. Okay. If sake goes a little bit over, you're not enjoying the taste anymore drinking it, uh, you can use it as a white wine substitute when you're cooking. Oh. So feel free, yeah, absolutely. So feel free okay. to use it as an alcohol for cooking if it's gone past you know, uh, the, the taste that you like. Uh, but keeping it in the fridge is the proper thing to do and keep it sealed up. Great, thank you. Yeah. So then Charles, Charles Curtis, Charles says maybe an air fryer, tabletop convention oven would be a good solution. What do you think, Tim? Instead of microwave? Well, yeah. you, know, you know what I actually do? Um, I don't have the setup here today, but I use a sous vide immersion blend, uh, the immersion circulator. Oh, wow. And I have a container and I put the, the immersion circulator in. I have the little small one and I keep the temperature of the water at the exact temperature I want the sake at. And you can leave the carafe in there and it's waiting for you at the perfect temperature. So wow. the immersion circulator is my real recommendation. Tammy, the emergent circulator people should give you like, let, the, let you do a little endorsement because there's one there more to, to sous vide and use that sous vide. Look, my, like, oh, there we go. Look, we got look one. at that. He pulls this out. I love it. <laughs> you know, every home should have one. That's amazing. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> every home should have one. They're fantastic. They're the best for warming sake. Yeah. That's so amazing. Well, we could sit with you all day, Tim. Thank you. That was, she's got one too. Well, I'm going to borrow yeah. yours, Margaret. <laughs> yeah. All these people with emergent circulators and stuff. <laughs> and also, how do I not have one? Someone want to send me one? <laughs> well, wait a minute. That, that means the two of us. It's a, it's a package deal, babe. Listen, Tonya, you, you and I, you will, one to me. we will proselytize for how to use it for cocktails and drinking right. and everything. Oh, yeah. All sorts of things. <laughs> Right before we, before we close, crazy. Christine has a question. How long does a typical open bottle? Yes, have a question. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah just, I'm eating. Just uh, curious. Because you said uh, before it loses, or when it loses its flavor, you can use it to cook. About how long does that usually last? And does the quality of the sake matter? Or, yeah. That's, yeah. The the more, aromatic, the more aromatic the sake is, the more it has like fruit and floral aromas, the shorter amount of time you're gonna have to really embrace that. If it's a dry sake like this one we're doing today, you have several months in the refrigerator to enjoy it. But if it's a very delicate floral, if it's very delicate and floral, you wanna drink that in a couple weeks. But oh, it's wow. much longer than you have with wine in any case. Nice. Got it. Holy, that's exactly. amazing. Thank so you. we have um, a preview for next week, and I know he's in service right now, so he's here. 
So I definitely, this is Tim. Thank you, Tim. I want to spotlight Donovan, who's here with us. And maybe there's people not getting cocktails right now at his bar because he's here <laughs> to tell us about next week. So Donovan, if we can spotlight you, that'd be really great because you're going to be doing, there he is. Hi, Donovan. Hey. What's up, everybody? I'm on a bathroom break, so we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> It's 1245, but like here we are, and I'm so excited you're here. So next week's theme is pineapple. So tell oh, yeah. us what you're going to be sharing with us next week. Um, next week, I'm excited to uh, share with you guys our very specific take on a pina colada here at Money Gun. You, you can't beat the classics. Uh, our bar is based around a menu of 30 very, very classic familiar cocktails, and you can't beat a good pina, uh, blended pina colada. So we're going to break out some blenders next week. Maybe we'll break out the sous vide machines if we all get one in time. But <laughs> we're going to have some fun. I'm excited. Not even I'll send you one. I'll get me one. I'll send you one over too. Anyway, awesome. thanks for using your bathroom break to say hello. And we'll definitely see you next week. I can't wait. We'll see you guys then. <laughs> and all that being said, Tonya, should we do our, our wrap? <laughs> we should. So, everyone, thank you so much. Lisa, for joining us today. Samras is absolutely delicious and fantastic. And, um, you know, I think more of us will probably be adding a little bit to our beverage in the morning. Coffee in the morning. <laughs> you know, whether it's, you know, virtual boozy brunch or not. Tim, thank you so much because language is so important as well when we're dealing with beverages, whether it's wine or cocktails or sake, even myself as a wine professional, I feel so much more comfortable now going into my favorite Japanese restaurant and ordering sake. Absolutely. And, you know, so we can't wait to see um, our plant shop and propagate. And, you know, much love, much love, much love. And we will see him. On the flip side. Well, for those who don't know, we did mention earlier, this is not a plant shop and Damien had to travel to California for an emergency, a family emergency, so couldn't be with us today. But he did launch his website. So if you're looking for amazing plants in found planters, he's doing some really cool stuff. Thanks, Tonya. I'm going to take over from here because as I mentioned, out of order, next week's theme is pineapple. And we have three amazing guests. Henry, who's here with us today, who's, um, you know, a master of hospitality, even though he's a Harvard-educated architect. And we love to learn about things. So I thought it'd be interesting to learn about what he does, what he does best in the world, and that's hospital design. But he designs with hospitality in mind. So Henry, do you want to say a word about what you're going to teach us about? Tomorrow, I know you're here. You have to press unmute. <laughs> no, I, I, I appreciate this opportunity. I think that, you know, if you think about you know, architecture, it's somewhat similar like food, that at a certain moment, you don't have to understand it. You just have to feel it, right? So that's one thing. But the difference is, though, I really envy you guys. And because, you know, hospital, you know, any things I do take two to three years to get it done. And you guys, two to three hours, you got a gratification. So, <laughs> like, and that's part of the thing I'm into the food because I can't really stand for the architecture that's waiting for way too long. <laughs> Well, I think it's just really exciting that even in these 20 weeks, in this audience, we have so many people who are world-class experts at all of these different topics. So I thought it would be fun to continue to bring in people to share their magic, not just their cooking and not just their drinking magic. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so our second guest for next week is going to be Donovan, and he's going to do those pina coladas, kind of the new spin, so we'll put that recipe up. And also, if you're in the Chicago area, you can buy course the pina colada kit you know have like 24 pina coladas ready to go in your refrigerator and then i don't know if joey made it in to see us today i hope they did and 
Joey is an amazing baker who's baked professionally and done pastry chefing here in Chicago professionally and has this really cool business, Flavor Supreme, making bespoke cakes. So we're going to do some cake decorating using all edible flowers and herbs. Check out their Instagram because it's just so decadent and fantastic and it's a really like new style i think of cake baking and also cake decorating so we're gonna go over a little bit about joey's cake thing and i think it's gonna be really fun so there's a drink there's a food and there's something to learn next week and of course a lot of really great small business owners to support so that's it we love you. This is maybe my favorite texture slide, Mark. This is a good one. We it's really pretty. Explore, right? Like we explored texture in our glasses, on our plates, and also texture in the fact that we love to learn more about you and all of our guests. So thank you for spending another Sunday with us. We can't wait to see you next Sunday. As many of you know, we hang out for a little while longer. So if you'd like to hang out, please do. If you have to run, we'll see you next week. So, you know, we should dance this out. Oh, oh yeah, we need to dance this out. <laughs> so we are, just so you know, we're getting together a little dance. We need like a virtual boozy brunch dance. Maybe we also need a DJ. Thanks, Karen, for moving. <laughs> I don't know what song we're dancing to, but we've got like a song in our hearts. <laughs> it's the Ibiza beach. It's the Ibiza beach thing. <laughs> I haven't figured out the whole music thing yet. <laughs> All right. I think.